In the year 1994, a gang stormed homes in the American city of Detroit, wearing police uniforms and shields. They typically targeted homes belonging to drug dealers and other gangs. When they raided a house dressed as police officers, the criminals inside believed they were indeed police and did not resist. Over time, their operations grew more violent. As the gang's brutality escalated, the FBI intervened to uncover the people behind this wave of terror, uncovering surprises they never expected. The FBI was unsure whether this gang consisted of mere criminals masquerading as police officers or if they included corrupt or former police personnel. This story is filled with intriguing events and chases between the FBI and gang members, so follow along and enjoy. The events of our story took place in the 1990s, specifically in Detroit, Michigan. Detroit is one of the American cities with several areas where dangerous gangs thrive. In these areas, drug trafficking, violence, and crimes such as theft, murder, and various assaults are rampant. Despite the efforts of the police and local authorities to combat these crimes, eradicating them is nearly impossible due to the sheer number of gangs present. All the police can do is try to control the situation and prevent things from getting worse. At first, the police thought the break-ins happening around the city were random, but soon they started noticing a disturbing pattern. Many reports described the gang breaking into homes while dressed in police uniforms, complete with shields. One of these break-ins took place in February 1994 in a well-known drug dealing area. The gang members wore uniforms with police written on them and carried heavy weapons, looking almost like a SWAT team, but they wore regular masks instead of police helmets. When the gang stormed the house, they shouted that they were the police. The people inside, used to police raids, didn't resist, thinking it was a legitimate operation. One man, even though he had a gun pointed at him, refused to cooperate at first, saying, you're police, you can't hurt me. But when one of the gang members shot close to his head and violently threatened him, he gave up the location of his hidden money, which was inside a sponge. The gang took the cash and left him in shock, realizing too late that they weren't real cops. The man called the police to report the robbery. When the real police arrived, they interviewed him and learned that no official raid had been planned for that day. This wasn't an isolated event either. There had been many similar incidents around Detroit. Almost every week, reports came in of gangs dressed as police breaking into homes threatening people with weapons and stealing money, valuables, and sometimes drugs. Most of the homes targeted were those of small-time drug dealers living in poor neighborhoods where crime was rampant. But the gang didn't stop there. They also targeted ordinary people. Innocent victims, including the elderly and women, were often treated just as harshly as the gang's drug dealing targets. Some were even assaulted. The gang's main goal was always financial as they were after the cash usually hidden in drug dealers' homes. As these violent robberies increased, the police logged over 50 break-ins that matched the gang's pattern in just a few months. Realizing the seriousness of the situation, they put together a special task force of investigators to tackle the growing problem. The Detroit police and FBI teamed up to take down the gang behind the break-ins. After looking into the recent string of robberies, investigators realized the gang wasn't just dressing like police. They were using tactics that closely resembled real law enforcement operations. At first, they thought multiple gangs might be responsible, but the evidence pointed to one well-organized group, likely made up of about eight members. Witnesses often reported seeing four to eight individuals during the raids. The investigators faced a major hurdle. Many of the victims were drug dealers and criminals who didn't want to talk to the police, fearing they'd get in trouble for their own illegal activities but the investigators assured them they weren't interested in making arrests. They were focused on catching the violent gang terrorizing everyone, including innocent people. As the drug dealers began to trust the police, they shared some information, but it wasn't much. This gang was careful not to leave behind any clues. Meanwhile, the raids continued and the violence escalated. In one heartbreaking case, the gang mistakenly targeted an elderly woman's home. Thinking they were raiding a drug dealer's house, they broke her hand while trying to force her to reveal the location of drugs and money, even though she had nothing to do with any criminal activity. They left without any remorse, cursing as they went. In another horrific incident, they assaulted a mother and her daughter during a break-in. 
there were at least six cases where women were brutally attacked during the gang's raids, which fueled the investigators' drive to catch them. Given the precision and methods used in the break-ins, the police began to suspect that the gang might be made up of former or even current law enforcement officers. They combed through records of dismissed police officers, especially those fired for corruption, theft, or drug-related crimes. However, despite their thorough search, they found no direct connection between the gang and any ex-cops. It became clear that the gang's violent approach, especially towards women, didn't match what they typically saw from corrupt officers who usually aimed to avoid drawing too much attention. Despite their best efforts, the investigators struggled to track down the gang. They combed through crime scenes and conducted numerous interviews, but new leads remained elusive until July 26th. That night, police responded to reports of a gunfight. When they arrived, they found a man who had been shot and left behind by his accomplices. He was dressed like the gang members, in police gear, a mask, and carrying a pistol capable of firing armor-piercing rounds. The man was rushed to the hospital, and investigators quickly identified him as Dante Garrison through his fingerprints. He matched the description of one of the gang members. Although Dante had been shot five times in the leg, hand, and abdomen, he was conscious and told investigators he was willing to talk after he rested. The police, sensing they finally had a breakthrough, gave him some time to recover, hopeful that he would help lead them to the rest of the gang. At the same time, they understood the importance of handling the situation delicately. Dante would only agree to cooperate if he felt comfortable and was given guarantees for his protection. The investigators returned to the task force headquarters and discussed strategies to ensure Dante's cooperation. They aimed to turn him into an informant who could provide them with insights into his gang. During these discussions, one of the police officers, Al Page, mentioned that he knew Dante and his family well, having known him since he was a boy. This revelation filled the investigators with hope as they recognized that Officer Page could be the ideal person to approach Dante and encourage him to cooperate. Officer Page visited Dante, leveraging his relationship with the family to gain his trust. However, Dante did not agree to assist them until he received assurances of protection from legal prosecution. The investigators agreed to his request, promising that he would be exempt from all charges in exchange for helping them identify every member of his gang. Dante consented and confessed that he was indeed part of the gang that broke into houses while wearing police uniforms and employing police methods. When asked about his injuries and the shooting incident, Dante recounted the story. He explained that the gang had planned to attack a house used by a drug gang. On the first day, they conducted surveillance, but one of the drug gang members spotted them and managed to escape before they could apprehend him. The following night, the gang returned to raid the house but the occupants were prepared and armed for a confrontation. As Dante and his gang attempted to break in, he was the first to enter. The drug gang members inside attacked him, shooting him five times in various parts of his body. His friends, who had been watching, abandoned him, fleeing without trying to help. Despite his severe injuries, Dante attempted to escape, but ultimately collapsed on the ground. After the police arrived, he was taken to the hospital, this experience likely influenced Dante's decision to cooperate with the investigators. He felt betrayed by his friends, who had left him defenseless and wounded. Once he had recovered sufficiently, the doctors discharged him from the hospital. The task force then transported him to a safe house, one of the FBI's secure locations outside of Detroit. There, they reassured him that he would be under their protection and that he need not fear any repercussions if he cooperated fully. His name was kept confidential throughout the investigations until all gang members were arrested and brought to trial. The investigators conducted extensive interviews with Dante, gathering detailed information about the gang. Initially, they believed the gang consisted of around eight members, but Dante revealed that their actual number was much larger, approximately 30 individuals. He explained that while the total membership was substantial, Individual operations typically involved four to eight members, chosen based on availability. According to Dante's confessions, those present and ready would proceed based on the gang's leadership structure. There were two leaders of the gang, Obi Carter and Andre Woods. These two men were responsible for running the gang, determining the targets for their break-ins, and selecting the members who would carry out the operations. Each leader had a specific role. Obi Carter was the mastermind behind the operations. He chose the houses to target, 
conducted surveillance and communicated with other gang members to gather information about the chosen locations. Obi Carter was primarily responsible for collecting intelligence for the gang. In contrast, Andre Woods served as the executive force, a large, imposing man who, at first glance, resembled a monster rather than a human being. He was in charge of executing the operations, from selecting members to orchestrating the raids. Woods was also responsible for training gang members, organizing practice raids on empty houses, and instructing them on how to use police and special forces tactics during their break-ins. He taught them how to enter homes, search for valuables, deal with the occupants, and extract information through force and intimidation. Woods was known for his violent nature and was often responsible for assaulting victims, particularly women. Torture was something he easily resorted to. If a victim or drug dealer refused to cooperate, he would not hesitate to beat them or shoot them in the legs or hands. In fact, he found enjoyment in the brutal methods employed by the gang. After each operation, the gang members would gather to divide the money and spoils. If drugs were part of the loot, it would be sold, and the profits would be distributed among the participants in the break-in. This distribution system ensured that all involved received equal shares, which was one of the gang's fundamental rules. This way, no one felt slighted, reducing the likelihood of disputes driven by greed. Despite the violence and brutality inherent in their operations, the gang operated with a degree of organization and intelligence. The information and details about the gang were revealed to the investigators through Dante's confessions. As a result, they learned the identities and names of most of the gang members. Many of these members had criminal records and had spent time in prison for various offenses, including theft, violence, assault, and drug dealing. Once the investigators received reports on the locations where the gang congregated and the houses they used as their headquarters, they deployed surveillance teams to monitor these areas. A significant number of police officers were involved in tracking the gang members, observing their gathering places and movements. The task force needed to gather as much information and evidence as possible to ensure successful convictions in court. They had to catch the gang in the act during one of their operations or obtain conclusive evidence that would not be open to debate. If their case was weak, even with Dante testifying against his former gang members, it might not be sufficient for a conviction. The investigators began eavesdropping on phone calls between gang members, a process requiring authorization from a judge. The presence of Dante as a witness was more than enough reason for the judge to grant permission for surveillance. It is important to note that during this time, mobile phone usage was not widespread and most people relied on pages for communication. A significant development in the case occurred on September 4th, 1994 when police received a report of a shooting incident at a house belonging to Andre Woods, one of the gang leaders. This house was an illegal gambling operation frequented by criminals, gang members and drug dealers, and it was known to have ties to some police officers. Upon entering the house, the police discovered four bodies. These individuals had been shot dead. Witnesses reported that Andre Woods had a dispute with the four men, leading to a skirmish in which he simply pulled out his gun and shot them. Without any hesitation, he left the house and got into his car. The FBI expanded their search for Andre Woods to the entire country, making him one of the most wanted individuals in America for this crime. All forces and security services were in pursuit of him. About a week later, something unexpected happened. Andre Woods suddenly entered the police command center in Detroit and surrendered himself. He told the police, I heard that you were looking for me, so I came here on my own. Investigators believe that Andre Woods turned himself in because the pressure from law enforcement and the continuous pursuit were overwhelming. The news around him was tightening. It was easier for him to fight the charges against him, deny them, and try to nullify them rather than remain on the run. Regardless, the investigators were aware that Andre Woods was imprisoned. At least they had removed him from the streets, as it was clear he was the most violent among all the gang members with the worst reputation at that time. The first leader was overthrown, and the second leader, Obi Carter, was identified as the mastermind responsible for planning the operations. The task force focused on him particularly more than the other gang members. They had undercover officers in civilian clothes watching him closely, but pursuing Obi Carter wasn't easy because he was smart and aware that the police might be monitoring him, especially after they apprehended Andrew Woods. 
Despite his caution and the precautions taken by the task force, the surveillance team managed to follow him. They continued their operations and intercepted calls from gang members discussing their operations and spoils. Through these conversations, investigators linked specific break-ins to the gang as the members mentioned what they had stolen and the details of their operations. This information would later help in court, but it wouldn't be sufficient evidence since they didn't know exactly who among the gang members was involved in which operation. The investigators aimed to catch them while they were executing one of their operations, hoping to apprehend them red-handed. One night, while a surveillance officer was watching one of the gang's headquarters, a seemingly ordinary car approached the house. In reality, it was an undercover police car. Four men got out, armed with pistols. These four officers were disguised in civilian clothes, and the surveillance officer was surprised. He contacted the operations center, quickly informing them that the four men were undercover officers, searching for an escaped criminal in the neighboring houses. This situation could have led to a major problem, as the gang members inside the house might have opened fire on the police. In fact, they noticed the hidden police and prepared themselves and their weapons for a clash. Even though the gang members knew the police were nearby, their experience with civilian police cars allowed them to recognize certain signs indicating police presence. The watching officer feared for the safety of the undercover policemen and considered warning them, but he realized that this could jeopardize the surveillance process and ruin the entire investigation they had been conducting for months. Fortunately, the four officers did not approach the gang's house and the disaster was averted without him having to expose himself. The task force, through monitoring the gang members' conversations, realized that the gang was indeed prepared to engage with the police if they approached the house. This indicated that the gang was even more dangerous than initially believed. If they were willing to kill policemen, it suggested they would do anything to avoid capture. Investigators understood that when attempting to arrest the gang members, they would likely face armed resistance especially since they wanted to catch them red-handed during an operation. The gang members would be armed and ready for conflict. However, the investigators also needed to consider that they couldn't raid the gang while they were inside a house they had broken into, as this could result in hostages being taken and potentially innocent people dying in crossfire. Therefore, they planned to confront and arrest them once they left the house under the guise of being innocent. The operation would not be easy. The gang members were armed with heavy weapons, including machine guns and pistols capable of penetrating armor. They decided to involve the special assault forces known as the SWAT team. The police forces met with the commander of the special forces and his assistant, explaining their plan to confront the gang and arrest them. The plan was for an officer from the special forces to ride in an ambulance and remain hidden while waiting for the gang to complete their operation. Once the gang finished and left the targeted house, they would likely use a large van for transportation. The special forces would then follow them in the ambulance, lights and emergency signals on, creating the illusion of a legitimate response. Instead of passing by, the ambulance would turn around to block the gang's escape, allowing the 20 special forces officers hidden inside to quickly descend and surround the gang's vehicle, preventing them from firing or engaging in a shootout. This was the overall plan. The primary objective of the investigators was to avoid a chase operation in the streets, as such situations could lead to numerous casualties. It was important to note that not all gang members would participate in the operation, meaning the number involved typically ranged from four to eight members, while the gang itself consisted of 30 individuals. Even if the police arrested just four to eight members, they could likely leverage their captivity to extract confessions regarding the rest of the gang, as those caught red-handed would be more vulnerable to threats of punishment. Finally, after weeks of surveillance and investigation, the investigators heard the gang members talking about a new operation, a large operation in which many of them would participate. This is the opportunity that the investigators had been waiting for, according to the calls between the gang members. The operation would take place on November 11, 1994. The target would be, as usual, one of the drug dealer's houses, but the gang members did not mention exactly where this house was in their calls. They did not know the exact location of the house. It was again the mission of the surveillance officers who followed the gang members on the ground. They had to try to find out the house, or at least the area where the operation would take place. The next day, the surveillance officers followed two of the gang members as if they were exploring the area where the operation would occur. 
They were planning their operations carefully. Their operations were not random, especially with the presence of their leader and mastermind, Obi Carter. By now, the investigators had almost all the information they needed, and all that remained was coordination with the special forces team that was going to carry out the arrest operation. To prepare the special forces members, they gave them all the information they had and assured them that the gang members were very violent, armed with dangerous weapons, and wore the same armor that the police did. To explain the extent of this gang's violence, they played a recording for them of the conversations that took place between the gang members when they saw the four undercover policemen. It was clear in the recording that the gang members were ready to kill the police without hesitation. The investigators played this recording for the special forces members to show them how dangerous these people were and that they would not hesitate to kill them, even if they were officers. The police had to be aware of this and fully prepared for the night of the expected operation, which was November 11th. All the security teams were fully prepared. The surveillance officers were spread out over several homes and headquarters of the gang and each one of them was trying to see if there were any movements indicating the gang's presence. In one of these houses, the surveillance officer who was watching this house noticed some movements. He saw six individuals coming out of the house with their weapons, wearing their shields, masks, and the police uniforms that they usually used in their operations. They got into a van, which they also usually used, and mostly moved toward the house they intended to target. The surveillance officer, of course, was behind them and kept tracking the van when it stopped at one of the houses. It was clear that this was the targeted house, so the surveillance officer immediately informed the operations center that the gang was currently carrying out their operation inside the house. The operations center, along with him, gave them the exact location of the house. They informed the special forces team, who were preparing and moving in an ambulance to a place near the house. A little later, the gang members came out of the house, carrying their spoils with them, and they got into the van. Along with the observing officer, the special forces team moved in the ambulance until they were directly behind the gang. They were supposed to turn around and support the ambulance to disable the gang's car. However, at the last moment, when the special forces tried to stop the gang, it seemed that the driver of the van noticed something strange and stepped on the gas. The van sped off escaping from the special forces. Unfortunately, the ambulance could not accelerate like the van. The ambulance was very heavy, and the number of passengers in it was more than 20 officers, so the gang easily escaped from them. Of course, the task force knew that if the gang got away this time, there was a possibility that they would not be able to arrest them a second time, because the gang would most likely stop all their operations indefinitely. Aside from the ambulance, there were two cars present at the scene. The first car had an officer named Steve Miller riding in it, who was the surveillance officer following the gang from the beginning of the operation. The second car belonged to the special forces and contained two officers. These cars seemed to be chasing the gang's vehicle. Suddenly, the tables turned because the largest number of officers were inside the ambulance that remained behind. During this chase, the gang members opened the back door of the van and opened fire on the two cars being pursued by the special forces officers who, as we said, were in one of the cars. They seemed to return fire on the gang. This was precisely what the investigators had hoped would not happen. They were hoping that there would not be a chase and shooting in the streets. The chase continued for a while, and then, suddenly, without explanation, the van stopped in the middle of the street. The officers inside their cars were watching and trying to understand what had happened. Why were the gang members standing there? Suddenly, four gang members emerged from the back door, shooting at the officers who returned fire. The officers shot them after the four were trying to escape. Officer Steve Miller, who was the observer, instinctively pursued the four who escaped, thinking that the special forces officers, who were in the second car, were just like him and were trying to catch up with the fleeing gang members. However, the special forces officers stayed next to the van because there were two people in front. They pointed their weapons at the gang members and ordered them to get out of the car, but the driver and his companion did not respond. Suddenly, they accelerated the van and the chase continued. Officer Steve Miller, in his pursuit of the four fugitives, thought that he was in support of the special forces. The gang member hid behind a wall, trying to set up an ambush for him, while Steve continued to run, believing he was following the right targets. He is the hunter, and they are the prey. 
He did not know that he was heading for a trap. Suddenly, when he reached the wall, the gangster opened fire on him from a close distance, and Steve responded quickly while moving away from him. The strange thing is that Steve was not hit by a bullet. Imagine that the gangster shot him from the ground. The distance is zero, and now Steve says that he's surprised at how he did not get shot in this confrontation. After that, Steve hid behind a wall, and at that moment, he realized that the other officers were not around him. He waited for a while because he realized that he was sitting facing four people, and he was afraid that they were ambushing him. Support finally arrived, including additional officers to assist him. Officers from everywhere began to flock to this area. Soon after, Steve moved along with the rest of the officers as they were circling the four gang members. Unfortunately, these minutes were enough to allow them to escape. After searching, the cops found one of the gang members lying on the ground. This man was clearly seriously injured, so Steve approached him and examined him. In fact, this man was deceased. After they discovered that this dead man was not just anyone, but Obi Carter, the remaining leader of the gang, as for the van and the special forces vehicle that was being chased, it stopped on the side of the road. The officers did not know why the van stopped. They were unsure whether the fuel had run out or whether it had suffered a malfunction. In any case, two people who were in the van got out. One of them surrendered immediately, but the second decided to try to escape. Some FBI investigators arrived at that moment and began to chase the fugitive on foot. After a short chase, they found the fugitive lying on the ground. This was the van driver, and it seemed that he was severely injured. This could explain the sudden stop, and despite his severe injury, he later survived. Accordingly, they arrested only two members of the gang who surrendered, one who was a fraud, and one who was the leader of the gang, Obi Carter, who died. The rest of them were able to escape. The investigators contacted several hospitals to ask if they had received cases of people injured by bullets. In fact, one of the hospitals informed them that a person had reached them who had been wounded by bullets. This was after one of the gang members had been arrested. At the same moment, security teams from the FBI, the police, and special forces stormed several homes and headquarters belonging to the gang. Inside these homes, they obtained spoils and stolen items that linked the gang to home invasion operations. They obtained, for example, jewelry and clothes that had been reported stolen by the owners as well as other items. They also found heavy weapons that the gang used, along with masks, armor, and clothes belonging to the police. These are all pieces of evidence that could help the investigators build a stronger case against them. But the most significant factor to decide the case was a confession. The gang members who were arrested cooperated, sitting with the investigators and telling them that they were now in a critical situation. If they were caught red-handed trying to shoot the policemen, these charges would lead to a fatal outcome. They would spend the rest of their lives in prison. However, whoever of them spoke first and cooperated with the police could potentially get a reduced sentence. The investigators were able to convince the gang members to talk and reveal the rest of their friends. The investigators knew most of the identities of the gang members from Dante's confessions, who was the first gang member caught. However, they needed confessions from those they had just captured for the case. To build a strong case against the rest, there had to be more than one witness and more than one person to confess. Of course, in addition to the evidence they had collected over the past months, call recordings, stolen items, weapons, and much more, they were back to knowing that the case was now bulletproof. A judge and all the evidence they needed was at hand. After that, they began to move to arrest all members of the gang. They arrested a total of 29 people who were then tried and convicted receiving different sentences according to the charges. The strange thing about all this is that despite the violence that occurred and the clashes between the gang and the police, not one officer was injured. Now, we have reached the end of our story. If you liked it, do not forget to like and subscribe to the channel and hit the bell button. Soon, we will back with another spine-chilling story.